Tokens can certainly play a role in building a network, but they are not a go-to-market motion in themselves. Pay attention to the kind of network you're building and how token incentives interact with network utility before relying them on as a bootstrapping solution. Hello and welcome back to Ethereum Audible. Ethereum in depth. I am Yehoshua Zlatogorsky and this is where we read the best in Web3 and Ethereum. Hope you're having a great Tuesday middle of the week. Today we're going to be diving into a new area, tokenomics. This is really Web3, not so Ethereum based. It's broad and things that people build on top of Ethereum and also just other chains. So today we're going to be reading a post called Bootstrapping Web3 Networks, The Limitations of Token Incentives. This is by Samir Singh. He's from breadcrumb.vc. And I wanted to dive into tokenomics because it's just a really interesting area. It's where the best in crypto kind of comes to be. It's the merging of technology, political science, economics, game design, and human psychology. And that's why tokenomics are such an interesting topic for me personally. And it exists in so many different projects. How you build them. Is it a Ponzi scheme? Is it not a Ponzi scheme? Is it a security? Is it not a security? And a good understanding of tokenomics and token incentives will help us figure out what projects are worth our time and what aren't. Why have a token? Why not have a token? When token? All of that stuff um, comes with tokenomics. And so I'm going to be diving into this topic with bootstrapping Web3 networks, the limitations of token incentives. But first, as always, I want to give a shout out to Alp Audio, your on the go app for in depth learning. If you want to take a course but don't have the time to do it, and the only time you have is when you're commuting or at the gym or running errands, you're sick of podcasts and trying to find that nugget of information in a 35 long minute interview, well, Alp Audio is the app for you. It's in-depth courses, audio with summaries, flashcards, additional resources so that you can dive in and learn more later. Just put up some new courses on venture capital, an introduction to venture capital, uh, a book club about a book called The Ascent of Money. And next week, we're putting out a new course called Customer Lifetime Value Masterclass. So lots of great content coming there. And with that, let's dive in to Bootstrapping Web3 Networks, The Limitations of Token Incentives by Samir Singh. Let's go. Tokens can be an effective way to bootstrap networks that need passive user participation, but they can be counterproductive for those that need active participation. Crypto tokens introduce financial incentives to technology products. The startup and Web3 ecosystem are still working out the implications of this, including how and why this can be useful. During this period of experimentation, one theory appears to have gained some steam. Tokens are a way to incentivize early network participants and avoid the cold start problem. This theory is tempting, but it's worth thinking through how widely applicable it actually is. Before we dive in, let's revisit the cold start problem, a well-known challenge for products with network effects including Snapchat or Airbnb. On these products, the addition of a user makes the product more useful for all users, but on day zero, they have no users and therefore no utility to offer new users. This forces them to find creative ways to reach a critical mass of users and achieve a base level of utility that can then attract new users. Tokens are viewed as a way to circumvent this problem. The following quote is from Chris Dixon's post on token incentives. Quote, the basic idea is, Early on, during the bootstrapping phase, when network effects haven't kicked in, provide users with financial utility via token rewards to make up for the lack of native utility, end quote. The image at the top of this post shows a visual depiction of this theory. NFX has proposed a similar idea called network bonding theory. According to this school of thought, tokens give early users a financial incentive to participate in a network. The addition of those users then allows the network to increase its utility and reach liquidity. And the image basically just shows that in a graph, that 
as the utility rises over time, you want to incentivize to people with tokens less and less. And so you want to give them a lot of financial upside in the beginning when the network utility is the least. And as the network utility increases, you decrease their financial upside, which is very similar to the way you might think about equity in a company. Those who join earliest receive the most equity, and therefore they have the highest financial upside. As the kind of utility or the risk factors decrease, people get less equity. Back to the article. Passive participation. When token incentives work. Chris Dixon and the A16Z team have cited a few examples of Web3 networks that successfully leverage tokens to reach liquidity. One. The first is Helium, a decentralized network that provides cheap, easy internet access to IoT devices in the wild, like e-scooters and sensors. Hosts can join the Helium network by buying its hotspots and connecting it to their Wi-Fi. Once they do that, the hotspots provide internet access to end users and rewards hosts with HNT tokens. The second example is Arweave, which is described as a decentralized censorship-resistant storage network. Miners hook up their unused hard drive space to the Arweave network, which can then be used by end users to store any type of data. Miners are compensated in AR tokens as long as data is hosted on their hard drives. Filecoin and StoreJ are other somewhat similar examples. Three, another example is Compound, a lending network. Lenders deposit their crypto assets into a lending pool for borrowers to access. Lenders then earn interest on their deposited assets and are rewarded with comp tokens for providing liquidity to the network. In each of these cases, the financial upside of the token was a strong incentive for early users to sign up and increase the utility of the network. But have you noticed the one facet that these networks have in common? They all require passive participation from users, particularly from supply side of their network, not very different from the concept of passive crowdsourcing in data networks. Once users connect their assets or resources to the network, whether that is bandwidth, storage, or crypto assets, they continue to earn tokens. That gives them financial upside and increases the utility of the network at the same time. The supply side does not need to actively engage with the network to benefit from this financial upside. However, networks with passive participation also tend to be rare. Most of the networks we use today require active participation, whether they are social networks like Snapchat and WhatsApp, or marketplaces like Airbnb and Uber. If you never open Snapchat, you add no value to the network. If you've never accepted bookings for your Airbnb listing, you add no value to the marketplace. Are tokens an effective way to bootstrap these types of networks? Active participation, the limits of token incentives. One of the most pr important principles of bootstrapping a network is to start with the most underserved users. Acquiring users is not enough to reach liquidity. You also need the right type of users, i.e. those who feel the problem most deeply and would put up with any amount of friction to engage with your network. When you acquire these users, activity outpaces adoption and the utility of the network grows. As a result, the network becomes significantly more valuable for newer users. This is especially important for networks that require active participation from users because liquidity requires recurring engagement, not just one-time adoption. Tokens can be a blunt instrument to target this underserved niche because they can attract the wrong types of users, those drawn to financial incentives and not the near-term utility of the network. So on a Web3 variant of Snapchat, tokens could attract high schoolers and also working professionals, irrespective of the kind of users the network needs at that point in time. When this happens, it becomes very difficult to reach the required density of the right kind of users. As a result, adoption does not have a direct impact on network utility, and the evolution of network value can look something like the visual below, which describes a the network utility staying the same and the financial upside being early in the early days, but at the end of the day, the, the utility doesn't rise, and so the financial upside also shrinks because there is no utility to the network. This shows what happens when there is a disconnect between financial incentives and network utility. Instant growth out of the gates, followed by a painful decline. Of course, this is an extreme theoretical scenario. What would this look like in the real world? Let's take a look at a few examples. When tokens meet active participation. The most obvious example here is LooksRare a decentralized NFT marketplace that launched in January of 2022. 
It was meant to be a decentralized alternative to OpenSea, which dominates the space. Unlike most Web3 networks, OpenSea is a centralized Web 2.0 style NFT market with strong network effects, at least as long as demand for NFT projects remain healthy. To overcome these network effects, Lookshare executed a vampire attack on OpenSea, as in it distributed or airdropped Lux tokens for free to high volume OpenSea users. It also rewarded users with Lux tokens for trading certain NFT collections on Luxrare. This go-to-market approach should have been enough for Luxrare to beat the cold star problem and scale its network. Unfortunately, financial incentives led to user behaviors that weren't aligned with the network. The chart above shows the genuine volume of NFTs traded on Luxrare after filtering out wash trading, as in the same NFTs traded back and forth between the same wallets to earn more token rewards. And the chart shows just a very large drop-off in traded volume between January 12th and March 3rd. Interestingly, genuine trade volume began to collapse as token payouts normalized. By the end of February 2022, Luxor daily genuine volumes had dropped to less than 5% of its peak and less than 3% of daily trading volume of Lux token. In essence, users were there to earn and speculate on tokens, not to engage with the network. Many other vampire attacks have led to similar results. Another NFT marketplace, Infinity, attempted the same tactic against OpenSea in October of 2021, with even more subdued results. SushiSwap, a decentralized exchange, executed a vampire attack on Uniswap in August 2020. The results again followed a similar trajectory, although perhaps less stark. Decentraland, a virtual world powered by NFTs, is a less obvious example, and one that doesn't involve vampire attacks. Facebook's rebrand to Meta in November 2021 triggered a gold rush for all metaverse-aligned projects in the Web3 ecosystem. This dramatically drove up demand for both Decentraland's MANA token and virtual real estate NFTs within its virtual world. However, most buyers appear to be financially motivated, and the utility of this virtual real estate remains low, as does engagement. This isn't to say that virtual real estate will never have any utility. It clearly can, but it will require active participation and engagement from its user base, with scaling tactics that are more likely to resemble active Web2 networks like Roblox, rather than passive Web3 networks like Helium. Aligning token incentives with utility. By now it should be obvious that tokens aren't a magic bullet. There are no shortcuts to building a network. Networks that just need passive participation from users can use tokens as one tactic to overcome the cold start problem, but networks with active participation can be harder to bootstrap. In these cases, token rewards can incentivize a behavior that conflicts with increasing network utility. How do we fix this? At a high level, the only way to address this problem is to link token incentives to network utility, as in to ensure that users can only receive tokens, token incentives if they add value to the network. In other words, rewards need to be restricted to specific, desirable actions, not just adoption. Braintrust, a decentralized freelance marketplace, is a good example of this. Packy McCormick recently published a deep dive into Braintrust and explains how its BTRST token works. Currently, it only distributes token to users who 1. refer clients or freelancers, 2. screen candidates after completing courses, or 3. freelancers who completed detailed profiles, courses, and jobs. Referrals, curation, and the core actions are key pillars for many Web2 networks. They're not unique to Web3. The only difference here is that tokens are being used as an alternative to another financial incentive and that is exactly what makes them effective. The downside, of course, is that this is a less effective hack to overcome the cold start problem on day zero. The bar for earning rewards is higher. That's a healthy trade-off for networks that require active participation. In fact, these types of networks may be good candidates for progressive decentralization, i.e. build a network the usual way first and introduce tokens for community ownership or governance and or rewards later. To summarize, tokens can certainly play a role in building a network, but they are not a go-to-market motion in themselves. Pay attention to the kind of network you're building and how token incentives interact with network utility before relying them on as a bootstrapping solution. Well, that is 
Bootstrapping Web3 Networks, The Limitations of Token Incentives by Samir Singh. And I really, really enjoyed this read. When it came across my Twitter feed, I really enjoyed it. And one of the main reasons for that is that last summer during the, I'll call it the Axie Infinity craze, maybe last summer, or last fall, it's, it's time to remember when things happened in crypto world. But the Axie Infinity craze gave rise to this huge, huge, huge influx of uh, thought leaders who said that play to earn is going to take over the world and people are just going to make a living playing games all day long. And you know what? That may be true in, in third world countries where you can do cheap labor and outsource it to the West, which is very, basically the same thing for you know Mechanical Turk or Axie Infinity. But the theme of just play to earn and this will just pay people with tokens and token incentivization does away with everything and you can build any web 2 platform and just add a token and it'll immediately beat the the web 2 company um just doesn't work for me uh bit clout kind of did that with twitter and was a huge craze for about a month and then died out amazingly and that's just because it's first level thinking that i'll just drop a token and people will love it and only use it for that and I think Chris Dixon also had this this post about how uh, this was focused on gamers, how your take rate is my opportunity. And so today, companies, game companies have a higher take rate. And the theory was that a Web3 gaming company could just dis- obliterate these companies because they don't need that take rate. They just have a much better economic structure. Because a Web2 company has to pay for distribution and marketing, and a Web3 company, a gaming company, wouldn't. Because it would just have this army of you know Twitter people who just go out and promote the game and get their friends into it because, you know, when token. And they have this financial alignment. And so they won't need to pay for marketing because the, the gamers will promote it because it's a Ponzi scheme and they'll get rich when other people join. Uh, that's kind of the underlying assumption that no one wants to say out loud, but that's really what it is. And this thread, this assumption that your take rate is my opportunity, just didn't jive. And in general, the euphoria around tokenomics just doesn't make sense. Because at the end of the day, you have to convince people to promote your product, to use your product, and it's people don't act purely based on financial incentives you would not use a bad Instagram app even if it paid you three, five dollars per per post because you just want to post your picture and share it with your friends. And if it doesn't give you that utility, you won't do it. Now, naturally, there is some equilibrium where if you got paid a hundred dollars per post, sure, you do it because it it makes sense. But the thing is that that app needs to pay those hundred dollars from somewhere. They can't just print it out of thin air And if they do, well, that's just token inflation and the value of the token just goes down. That was the case for many, many projects where they were just printing quote unquote tokens, distributing them as financial rewards, not realizing or the people who are holding it not realizing that this is just inflation and it's hurting the value of their tokens. And most of these projects survive in bull markets because there's more demand for the tokens than there is for than there is distribution. So there's more demand than there is supply during crazy bull market run-ups. And so the tokens go up. But if there's no utility, there's nothing underlying the value of that token. There's no trading, there's no economy, there's nothing to use it. And that's really what happened also with Axie Infinity and both of their tokens that have come down, they went up really big in a hype and they came down. The same is true for the Brain Trust token, which they have put utility underlying it, which is great. But because the most of the holders of these tokens are financially motivated or speculatively motivated, the value of the token detaches from the underlying fundamentals. And so there is a huge, huge mismatch. It's just a lot, a lot, a lot of these tokens. And when you're designing the tokenomics, you have to think, what is the utility? Who is using it and why? And without that core assumption, there is none of this, your take rate is my margin opportunity. Because people don't think that way. They don't operate that way. 
And just because I play a crypto game and hell, I make some money because I get paid in its in its tokens. I, I play Crypto Raiders. I'm a big fan of the project, but I'm not going to go shill it to my friends just because I know that if they buy in, there'll be more demand and my tokens will go up. I'm not going to go promote it on my social media because my personal reputation is more important to me and not everyone who follows me on social media is interested in these things. And so they might get an occasional like from me if they put out good content, but the same is true for Disney who might get an occasional like from me. And just because I hold their tokens doesn't mean that I'm going to go risk my social reputation or my friendly reputation with other people. At the end of the day, it's a computer game. I just want to play a computer game. And so just because there's tokens involved, the the amount of activity in a network won't change. And that's why I really liked Samir's uh, delineation between active participation and passive participation, because I'm more than happy to kind of buy tokens and just stake them if, I, if I'm a passive participant and I know that in the future there will be some utility. And in that sense, I think he's really right that token economics and token incentives work very well for passive participation. But when it comes to active participation, you really need to find the right users, the users who are interested in what you're building and who are going to take part in the network and your project and not just for financial means because they are just renters. They will come and go to whatever project pays them the most. I think that's a, a good little rant that I had here about tokenomics. As you can see, it's a, it's a topic that's close to heart. I think we're going to continue down this thread. It's a really interesting area of the crypto world and the Web3 world where you know, the political science, the economics, the tokenomics, the, the contracts, they all mesh together. Um, and so I think we're going to continue this thread for another read or two. And yeah, I hope you enjoy it because it's involved in every single project you're going to be in.